having these top predators like sharks in your environment is a good indicator that your environment is healthy. So one of the really interesting phenomena that we see at French Frigate Shoals is this seasonal predation of fledging seabirds by tiger sharks. What we have learnt is that during a very short period of the year, typically three or four weeks, when albatross chicks are making their maiden flights, tiger sharks have figured out both the timing and the location of this event so they can go and prey on these very, very naive fledglings. It's a very, very easy source of food because these birds have never seen a predator before and there's a tiger shark waiting there that just eats them. We still have a lot to learn about feeding in sharks and fishes. We know a lot about diet because for centuries we've been able to cut them open and see what's in the stomach. What we don't know is how often they feed, how much they typically eat in a given foraging session, and for, for the most part we don't know where they're feeding. So when we are planning to tag sharks, um, there's a lot of preparation involved. So we go out with a boat that's absolutely loaded with stuff, but in broad terms has a variety of fishing gear and bait, and then a variety of tagging equipment. We will go out to a location where we believe we can catch sharks, and we will put down a line that has a number of baited hooks on it, and that will sit on the seabed, and we will leave it there for one, two, sometimes three hours. We pull the line back in and see what we've captured. We tag any sharks that are on the line. First of all, you start with a shark that has a hook in its mouth, but you have to restrain it in order to be able to measure it and tag it. Once we have that noose around the tail, we then have the shark attached at both ends and we're able to roll it upside down. And that's really important because when you turn a shark upside down, it goes into a state that we refer to as tonic immobility, which is, is more or less a trance-like state where the shark lies there very calmly. And that allows us to then, first of all, take some measurements. We may do a small surgery to allow us to implant an acoustic transmitter because we've uh, demonstrated through our research that sharks and fishes will retain the transmitter for years. So it's a very useful technique for doing this sort of long-term tracking of individuals. We put an identification tag on, and then that's like the shark's license plate, for one of a better way of putting it. And if we then recapture that shark, we are able to get that unique number off the spaghetti tag. And these sharks endure a lot of uh, natural trauma, so they're very, very well adapted to easily be able to handle the two little holes that we put through the fin. Now, when the camera package comes off, those holes will heal up. Everything just goes away. Finding a tiny little package, which is about the size of a shampoo bottle or something, in the Pacific Ocean is, is much more than finding a needle in a haystack. First of all, we need to find the haystack. So the shark carried the package for four days. We could hear the package, but we didn't know where it was. I was actually communicating with one of my colleagues who was able to go online and then relay the first actual satellite position. When we got up the next morning, by then we had a good set of satellite fixes that showed us the drift trajectory of the package. By this stage, I think it was at least 30 miles west of French Frigate Shoals. Now, when we got close to that location, as soon as I switched on the VHF receiver and I heard a ping, I knew that we would be able to get that package back. You try and get that camera angled as best as possible, but there's the potential for it to be at a bad angle so that all you have is like a full frame of shark skin and nothing else. And then you have to hope that the shark did something interesting because tiger sharks in particular are very good at swimming around the ocean for hours and hours and hours doing nothing at all and encountering nothing at all. So I've reviewed 
literally thousands of hours of tiger sharks swimming through blue ocean seeing nothing. Um, but fortunately, we got a really interesting scavenging event. And some years ago, we published a paper on tiger shark growth in Hawaii, and they actually grow pretty quickly. Because they are not warm-blooded like humans, they can put more of their energy into growth. And so they only need, on average, about half a pound of fish a day. To date, nobody else on planet Earth has ever captured a tiger shark scavenging event with a camera mounted directly on the shark. And until we started using these shark mounted cameras, we had no idea about this behavior that it even existed. And so it's been a very, very useful tool for gaining direct insights into how sharks are using the marine environment.